Stephanie. Uh, many thanks for this kind introduction to Professor Lloyd Weeks. It's a great pleasure to give this talk in our Arabian Peninsula lecture series. And uh, as Lloyd said in my lecture, I shall talk about the Royal Mounds of Ali uh, in what I'm afraid for some of you might be in excruciating detail. Uh, I will uh, primarily talk about the Royal Mount of Ali project, which I've led since 2010. The project is a collaboration between the Bahrain Authority for Culture and Antiquities and the Moscow Museum in Denmark. The project is still ongoing, but uh, we published a monograph that you can see in the upper left corner. And if you wish, a PDF of that uh, book can be downloaded from my ResearchGate uh, profile. In the 1950s photo on the screen, you can see some of the Royal Mounts, which consist of a group of about 14 monumental tombs dating to the early second millennium BC. Unlike the majority of Bering's burial mounds, which are typically much smaller, the Royal Mounds originally stood up to 15 meters in height. Over the last century, the archeological site has become completely engulfed in the urban fabric, but fortunately, in uh, 2019, the Royal Mounds were enshrined in the UNESCO World Heritage List. In the, uh, in the open space in the distance, you can see some of the 4,000 burial mounds which still survive in the associated compact Ali Mound Cemetery. In 1953, Moscow Museum, which I represent, uh, launched a series of archaeological expeditions to the Arabian Gulf countries, which has endured until today. The single greatest achievement of these expeditions has been the discovery of the Bronze Age culture, originally known as Dilmun to the ancient Babylonians. There are several reasons why the discovery of the Dilmun culture is so significant. One is that Dilmun was located exactly on the crossroads between the great civilizations of Middle Asia. In the Bronze Age, the Arabian Gulf served as a vital corridor for commercial exchange connecting the Indus civilization in the East with the urban societies of Mesopotamia in the West. In addition to its own importance, the study of the Dilmun culture helped us link these uh, two major centers of civilization and their archeology. span Additionally, the land of Dilmun appear in some of the earliest written records dating to the third millennium BC. And uh, in these texts, Dilmun is portrayed both as a, as a fabulous land of myth and a very real land and city that dominated the long distance sea trade. The fortunes of Dilmun waned and waxed with its changing positions in the networks of international trade. But around the turn to the second millennium BC, the Dilmun culture flourished and trade with Omani copper and developed into a state-like society. And um, at that point, Dilmun's political and commercial center was firmly centered on Bahrain Island. Bahrain is uh, exceptional in the otherwise extremely arid Gulf region because it was blessed with an abundance of freshwater springs and vast uh, gardens of date palms. It was originally the spectacular burial mounds that drove archaeologists to Bahrain. And um, in the 1950s, there were still more than 76,000 burial mounds left on the island. After the discovery of oil, construction work has regrettably taken a heavy toll on their numbers. Bahraini archaeologists and others have made a stupendous effort and excavated about 5,000 mounds before they were destroyed. And in the work presented here, I have benefited immensely from the data that was salvaged in that process. The most important site discovered by uh, my museum is the ancient capital and harbor of Dilmun, which is located on the north coast. By this point, there can be no doubt that this site uh, is the place known as the city of Dilmun uh, in early second millennium BC's busy sources from Babylonia. The, um, the archeological remains of that city were discovered inside this settlement mound on top of which a much later fort, Cala del Bahrain, had been built by the Portuguese. A city wall encircles 15 hectares of the Bronze Age capital, and its construction at the end of the third millennium BC showed that 
Dillman had become a stratified society with a centralized political leadership. Tablets with royal correspondence from modern Syria and other sources from Iraq confirms that the rulers of Dillman were regarded as kings by their contemporaries. At roughly the same time, Dillman's, Dillman adopts a administrative protocol from the Indus civilization, which includes a stamp seals with Indus script and the Indus weight system. The first Moscow museum and later French excavations led by Pierre Lombard have uncovered a series of monumental storeroom buildings that must have formed part of Dillman's palatial economy. As we shall see later in my talk, the multi-room plans of the palatial storerooms were symbolically reproduced in the ground plan of some of the later royal burial chambers. And uh, on that note, I return to the royal cemetery. Uh, the monuments at Ali have always featured prominently in the landscape of Bahrain, and for that reason, visiting European scholars in particular have long speculated that they were the tombs of some forgotten kings of old. Bahrainis and many others before them had excavated at Ali, but the results were both disappointing and inconclusive. However, even if the site was heavily compromised and the available data of a poor quality, we were of the opinion that a new approach could produce valuable information about the emerging Dillman kingdom. Our, uh, our optimism about this site its potential assumes that we are dealing with a genuine dynastic royal cemetery. And this would have some serious ramification about what types of questions we would be able to address. Because in emerging kingdoms and early states, the dynastic cemetery appear as one of the most fundamental institutions of statecraft. In its most simple definition, the royal cemetery is a place of burial relating to a genealogically real or imagined line of hereditary rulers. Over time, as the dynastic cemetery becomes multi-generational, its institutional characteristics and properties will develop and they will mature. Eventually, the institution will function as the center for the cult of the royal ancestors. Monuments and monument building that aims to memorialize the royal elite officially represents the foundation for many early royal cemeteries. Royal tomb building may take the form of grand public building projects in order to establish social cohesion and internalize and legitimize uh, social order. In societies where royal tomb building is corporate uh, and public, the events are often used to test and confirm the constitution of political authority. Consequently, in the early days of kingdoms and states, one often sees intensified monument building as a response to the need to enforce positions in the new rank hierarchy. The uh, political authority of the incumbent king and the dynastic line is naturalized in the minds of the population through the continued presence of and regular moving past these monumental royal tombs. And through its monumentality, monument building, symbolism and ceremonies, the dynastic cemetery becomes Sort of a denominator and an enforcer that sets the agenda for the social stratification at large. The dynastic cemetery's official function of honoring the royal ancestors often masks the institution's far more crucial role of securing the succession of the royal line. The death of a king creates some exceedingly dangerous political circumstances and therefore one often sees that the rights of royal succession are deeply nested within the rights of royal death and burial. At first, this logic may appear counterintuitive, but uh, a crown prince will often need to move fast to assert his claim to the royal throne. By the uh, classic proclamation, the king is dead, long live the king. Historic monarchies effectively seeks to compound this dangerous, dangerous liminal uncertainty into a short split second. Regardless, the death of a king places the heir in imminent danger because it opens the testing ground for contenders and clements to the throne. While the heir apparent is often preoccupied with the planning of the royal burial, which is one of the most resource demanding state rituals, the crown prince must simultaneously be ready to confront and identify potential usurpers both in and outside of his ranks. 
So for those loyal to the heir, it becomes imperative that the royal burial as an arena of vertical competition is kept under full control. The way the dynastic cemetery institution ensures that this objective is accomplished is through predefined ritual. And in early kingdoms, the dynastic cemetery is often the institution where the performance of state rituals is most clearly expressed. And as archaeologists, we can hardly hope to see the constitution of political authority expressed more manifestly. The mounds, which the project now have confirmed to be royal tombs, are located at the north end of a cemetery of originally 11,100 smaller burial mounds, which arguably makes it the largest of its kind in the world. In uh, this 3D reconstruction based on historic aerial photos, the Ali Cemetery can be seen from north looking south. At uh, first glance, the spatial arrangement of tombs suggests that the cemetery was highly structured according to rank and class. Larger tombs cluster in a band along the northern and western edges, culminating in the huge tombs of the Royal Cemetery proper in the northern corner. Clearly all the larger tombs were not those of paramount kings, but should instead be assigned to lower ranking members of the royal family or senior courtiers. Accordingly, one of the first major analytical problems we've had to face is to isolate the tombs of paramount kings. Before we get into that, I will talk more about the special analytical potential of the dynastic cemetery institution. My approach to the Royal Cemetery has been one that focuses on isolating an institution and understanding its properties. I believe that by studying important and archeologically visible institutions, we can obtain an important lens through which others, but archeologically more obscure aspects of society can be investigated. As an institution, the uh, dynastic cemetery, uh, such as the Royal Mounds of Arnie, has some very distinct properties that sets it apart from other institutions, as I've discussed before. The action through which it comes into social existence and manifests itself in the physical world is governed by a pre-existing set of rules and some of these rules or laws which govern a dynastic cemetery are so intimately tied in with its unique logic that they become of an almost cr cross-cultural nature. And as archaeologists, this gives us a great advantage when we wish to make sense of a site like the Royal Mounds of Ali. Uh, this hypothesis, among other, builds on the following assumptions about the institution. A dynastic cemetery represents a constituent of society which is fundamentally distinct from most other societal components that can be studied archeologically. It's an explicit expression of royal power with unprecedented potential to study the evolution of political society. It's generated as a continuous sequence of events without overlap, and that's rather important. And consequently, it offers a less ambiguous interpretive frame than other institutions. Analytically, that's very important because we can assume that the genesis of the Royal Cemetery was a chronological string of tomb building events and royal burial events, and this was continuous. The assumption is based on a simple logic where you have incumbent monarch A who commissions and complete the construction of his burial monument during his reign and then following his entombment the construction of a, a succeeding royal burial monument was at the very earliest instigated after the assertion to the throne of King B, and so forth and so forth. If the individual tombs of all early Dilmun sovereign, sovereign rulers could be identified at Ali, this collection of dynastic tombs could then be seen as a continuous chronological sequence without any overlap and would provide us with otherwise inaccessible data about the early Dilmun state. If the series of, of royal tombs could also be uh, convincingly sorted based on architectural typology, we would have a very powerful data set. This data set would represent a strong foundation for chronology building, especially if every royal tomb building event could be radiocarbon dated. And then the dating range for each uh, event would represent a point in time in that anonymous king's reign. And theoretically, then we could establish a proxy king list, 
based on that series of dated events. These radiocarbon dated royal tomb building events would provide a rather formidable vantage point for chronological modeling by means of Bayesian statistics. Um, however, prior to the, the present investigations, the Royal Cemetery was a poorly understood archeological site. As you can now see in the red square uh, in the map, um, much has been destroyed since the 1950s. And this initially presented our project with uh, some substantial problems. And uh, matters were further complicated by the fact that the uh, remaining monuments all have been looted and ransacked in, the, in antiquity. The project's empirical foundation was developed uh, then through a combination of intensive archive studies, studies of previous excavations and new excavation. The, um, the data from older excavation has been incorporated into our database and this information has greatly helped guide our strategy. Excavation has so far been conducted a total, at a total of 16 mounds, but the, uh, the daunting size of these monuments and their value as heritage sites prevent, prevents their full excavation. And therefore we've not touched uh, floor levels, which we uh, thought might be secondarily undisturbed. Um, and therefore I won't be showing a lot of, of of uh, small finds. Uh, otherwise, or alternatively, the strategy has been to clear out older disturbances and, um, and thereby expose enough of the original architecture to allow us to make a digital reconstruction. For each mount, the existing architecture was then documented and uh, a re reconstruction was created to support our further analysis. And uh, very fortunate from an archeological point of view, the architecture of the royal tombs has uh, gone through uh, both substantial and gradual change across, across the lifespan of the, the cemetery. As you can see in the reconstruction on the right-hand side, the monuments were originally of a stepped appearance. The ring walls, walls of each cylindrical drum were clad in the limestone ashlars of rather huge proportions. And um, both elite and royal tombs had superimposed burial chambers and they were always constructed in the shape of a capital Latin letter H. As you can see in the case of this early royal tomb, access was in the first generations gained to the chambers by way of a Dromos passage. Over time, uh, the Dromos passage uh, fell out of, of vogue and was replaced by vertical access shafts. After the introduction of vertical access shafts, the chamber architecture also becomes more elaborate. As an example, the entrances to the four uh, chamber alcoves get these tapered indentions and individual door lintels of dressed stone masonry. In the case of this royal tomb, a massive support structure was furthermore erected to uphold the two-story chamber. The uh, distribution of the Dromos passage gives us a good impression of how the Royal Cemetery started to emerge. And, um, and here you see the, uh, the contrasting distribution of tombs with, with vertical shafts. The shaft was introduced about halfway into the lifespan of the cemetery. And uh, this architectural change uh, combined represents a very excellent chronological marker. As a little aside, the, um, the burial chambers of both common and preeminent Dilmanites always appears to have been oriented to uh, point, um, to face the point of sunrise around the time of burial. And that way the, the dead probably in accordance with the leaves associated with the journey of death could be placed with the head towards the reborn sun. And during the year, the, the point of sunrise, like everywhere else, moves across the, uh, the eastern horizon. And in Bahrain, the orientation of the uh, chambers display a corresponding fluctuation. In the Royal Cemetery, a, um, a change in, in chamber orientation has exposed some interesting details about the, uh, the timing of the Royal tomb building events and the development in that. In, uh, in contrast to, to ordinary uh, burial mounds, the royal tombs, they had to be constructed well ahead of the time of the death of the king. 
because of their size, and there were thus ample time to to coordinate the building of the tomb with other events in the ritual calendar. At the earlier tombs with Brummer's access passage, uh, it can be shown how the chamber direction apparently was staked out from April to, to September during what is the hot summer season. Perhaps the, uh, the September equinox marked the end of elite tomb building and the beginning of new events in the ritual calendar. But later this must have changed. Um, because after the, um, the change and the, to the, and the introduction of the shaft, chambers appear to have been staked out from October to April. And that's when temperatures are much milder and cooler in the rain, um, suggesting a, a, a recalibration with the ritual calendar of some sort. Um, but after this digression, uh, I now move back to the overall architecture. The, uh, the, the last generations of, of, um, of royal tombs, uh, we found out, were constructed almost entirely of plaster and stone. And these um, are also the, by far the most elaborate monuments. They clearly imitate palatial architecture, such as the, uh, the storeroom, build, storeroom buildings I showed you earlier from Dillman's capital at Calada Bahrain. The, the H-shaped uh, ground plan is still maintained within the chamber plan but uh, much new space and rooms have been added. <clears throat> As I, um, I mentioned in the strategy uh, talk, uh, one of the chief aims of the project was to develop an absolute radiocarbon-based chronology of the royal tombs. The, uh, the strategy was to locate charcoal samples embedded in the wall plaster of the tombs. This, uh, this, this charcoal was very well suited because it came from the palm branches used uh, in the burning of the lime, used for mixing the plaster, and thus date uh, close to the time of construction. And of course, that is, is what we want to get our fingers on. Um, as excavation uh, greatly expanded our picture of this site, the uh, resulting digital reconstruction has rather completely altered our perception of the Royal Cemetery. The, uh, the mapping represents uh, one of the vital steps towards a deeper understanding of this, this uh, institution. And although the, uh, the reconstruction is far from complete, it, uh, as you see here, still represents a significant advance from when our investigation started in 2010. Hereafter, the observations from the Royal Cemetery has been framed within Dillman's long-term social evolution. And uh, I should say that the possibilities to investigate diachronical trends are rather exceptional um, in Bahrain because we are left with a frozen picture of 500 years of accumulated mound building and burial ritual. This means that we, we, we have a mound building tradition that uniquely captures um, and fully covers the transition to statehood. Well before the emergence of, of a state and a kingship organization, a Dillman can, for lack of a better word, be classified as a tribal society. Around uh, 2250 BC, burial mounds first appear in the form of these circular, flat and circular tombs. Um, these are found scattered centrally on the island. The, the dead is, as I said, always placed in a fetal position inside the chamber with the head in the east, and they're often facing an alcove in the chamber wall. This uh, choreography of the body and the sceneography of the chambers suggest a symbolic link between the, the burial and the female uterus or womb. I've argued that in the rites of passage, the alcove may have originated uh, in this way, uh, from originally have been a symbolic birth canal, the ritual function of which was by means of a second symbolic birth to facilitate the safe transition to the other side. Uh, there is, however, and those are the tombs I show here, which are rather womb shaped, but there is, um, however, an overwhelming range of other chamber shapes that appear, um, which our analysis has shown to reflect the uh, structure of a tribal hierarchy. The, um, the number of alcoves a chamber was given 
he appears to have been where it is inversely proportional to the frequency of that chamber type. And from that, uh, I conclude that the different chambers reflect a system of the rank grouping. There is great variation, especially in the chambers with four alcoves that uh, already at this time were reserved for individuals of the highest rank. And uh, you can see here that large amounts with longer chambers positively correlate with a high number of alcoves. And this uh, pattern is again a testament to unequal access of resources and uh, events that class differences underpin this tribal hierarchy. The burials of, uh, of Dillman's tribal period chiefs are scattered throughout the central distribution of 28,000 ordinary mounds. Such tombs were encircled by outer ring walls and the, these tribal chiefs only represent one in a thousand of the entombed population. The, um, the absence, as you could see here, in the tribal period of irregular, of regular elite cemetery clusters is significant because it uh, appears to document that a dynastic cemetery institution with hereditary transmission of power and so forth had not yet fully materialized. But um, around 2050, uh, the Dillman state started to emerge and with that, uh, a new type of much higher and, and now conical burial mound was introduced. And uh, yes, and simultaneously, these uh, 10 vast mound cemeteries, as I, as I clicked on the map, started to develop. The, uh, the chamber shapes now become more standardized and restricted to uh, rectangular L-shaped and T-shaped. Um, the elite chambers with four alcoves are from now on only built in the shape of the Latin capital letter H. And um, the seeming cultural unity and continuity, which can be observed uh, in this reproduction of the ancient chamber system, probably aim to conceal some political tension. Because from now on, the highest ranking H-shaped chambers, or what was formerly chambers with four alcoves of many shapes, are only built in the newly forming cemetery at Ali. To legitimize and cement its right to rule, a new ruling class apparently asserts full monopoly over the rank associated with these H-shaped chambers. And this development appears to show that a royal elite effectively had established control over Dillman. The concentration of power is even more resoundingly expressed in the distribution of new tombs with outer ring walls. This, uh, by this time, ancient tribal system of chiefly rank is now also exclusively reserved for the community which is entombed at Ali. It, um, it remains a distinct possibility that the entire cemetery population at Ali belongs to one huge extended royal lineage of which obviously only a tiny fraction ever held the office as King of Dillman. The overall best candidates for the tombs of kings are, of course, the largest mounds at Ali. However, um, exclusive features such as two-story tombs, eight-shaped chambers, and outer ring walls appear too frequent to identify all these tombs as kings. As we have already seen, um, the burial custom continued to reproduce the old chamber system, even after the appearance of the early state. However, our analysis show that in every respect, these gigantic monuments are in a, a class of their own, pun intended. And in addition to their exceptional size, their huge H-shaped chambers have in many cases been extended with this uh, appendix room. The, um, the introduction of appendix rooms appear to have been motivated by a need to architecturally distinguish the tombs of kings from uh, tombs of, of the other lower ranking uh, royals. When the, um, when the appendix room first appear in the royal cemetery, it's only uh, in, the, in the lower burial chamber. 
but already in the second generation of royal tombs, uh, an appendix room is uh, added uh, to both the upper and lower chambers. In the last two generations, the appendix room has been equipped with an elevated podium step of plaster and uh, some extra uh, minor uh, uh, alcoves. The introduction of the appendix room must have been accompanied by new rituals of royal burial. The uh, introduction of new rituals is also evidenced by a development in the, the doorways of the royal tombs. As a rule, uh, the burial, uh, or after the burial, all elite chambers were sealed with the simple stone blocking door and the dromos or later shaft was filled in. Ritual re-entering is, is possibly suggested by a small opening, which we currently can be observed in, in the upper left corner of many of these uh, blocking doors, but it, that may also just be targeted looting. The, uh, the opening in the latest royal chambers are constructed as, as these monumental palatial style doorways with well-dressed door jams, uh, often five meter high. And the earliest doorways uh, of this type are still sealed with a stone blocking door, but now there is also evidence uh, for a wooden inner door. The evidence uh, for this inner door is here in the form of a pivot hole drill, pivot hole drilled into the stone roof. But in the, uh, the following generations of royal tombs, the stone blocking doors are replaced by solid stone doors. And this colossal door which has been forced out of place by what appears to have been Bronze Age looters, is perfectly carved from a single stone. The same two tomb originally also had a wooden inner door, and uh, the location in the wall of a possible bar hole stone inside the chamber uh, suggests, as you can see here, that this uh, wooden inner door could only be locked by someone standing inside the tomb. This, um, this slightly, slightly unnerving fact was fully confirmed at the last of the royal tombs where the barhole stone was still in place in the wall. And uh, this royal mound was completely excavated parallel to Moscow's investigations by our Bahraini colleagues from Baka. And obviously this inner door bolt and inner doors has got you wondering as to whom was left alone uh, alive in the dark tomb. And I think, uh, I won't get into that, but uh, I discussed that in the book that it has to do with the uh, rituals of royal succession. But um, sensationally, in this tomb, there were three cuneiform inscriptions on fragments of stone vessels, which mentioned the entombed king by name. These inscriptions were translated and analyzed by Professor Gianni Marchesi from the University of Bologna. The inscriptions identify two kings of Dilmun, and their discovery is a virtual breakthrough in our understanding of ancient Dilmun. All three inscriptions read Palace of Yachliel, the servant of Insak of Agarun. Insak is the very king entombed in the royal mound. And the fact that all three mention a palace suggests that the vessels belong to such a facility and were transported to the tomb at the time of the royal burial. We, we already knew from the Babylonians that Insak was the ancient god of Dilmun, and the, uh, the name Agarum is probably the name used locally for Dilmun. The expression, the servant of Insak of Agarum, must have been the royal title standard. This exact title was already known from an undated inscription found by Captain Durand in Bahrain in 1873 on a stone. This lost inscription, this stone and inscription is now lost, it's, but it's identical to the three new inscriptions, but the name Yakliel is replaced in that with the name Rimum. But uh, until now, this Rimum figure was a completely enigmatic uh, character in Near Eastern studies. Amazingly, one of the three new inscriptions explicitly states that Yakliel was the son of Rimum. 
Uh, equally exciting, uh, all this allows us to identify the tomb of Yahliel's father and predecessor. Because in, instead of the usual eight-shaped chamber with four alcoves, it had for some reason become important for King Yahliel to get a tomb with six alcoves. But uh, because of a mistake uh, with the plan of the tomb, where a vestibule was was not constructed for the door. Uh, they had to move in a, an, an alcove side chamber and it became strangely asymmetrical. But originally it should have looked like this. And that brings me to my point because the intended design of Yagiel's tomb would have made it identical to this unique neighboring royal mound we saw before. And I think by implication, we can identify the tomb of Yagliel's father and predecessor, King Rimmon. All evidence suggests that Yagliel's tomb was one of the last built and that Yagliel had been laid to rest in an orderly fashion, probably by his anonymous son and successor, who was one of the last kings, if not the last king of the Ali dynasty. A colossal ruin mound one and a half kilometers south of the Dilmun capital was included in the investigation because its architecture was suspiciously similar to the tomb of Yakli El and Rimmon. Amazingly, this very destroyed tomb subsequently turned out to date to around 100 years after the tomb of Yakli El. By means of correspondence analysis, I've further investigated the architectural variation in the 24 most elaborate tombs. Some of these are elite tombs, some of these are royal tombs. And I did that based on 28 architectural variables. And this gave some rather strong insights into chronological aspects uh, pertaining to the uh, architectural typology. Importantly, it allowed a separation of the earliest royal tombs built in simple style, those which have drummers, from the chronological late tombs with, with shaft constructed in what I have identified as the palatial style. Here in the plot, the tombs of higher nobility have been isolated and can be seen as a cluster in the upper right quadrant. The earliest royal tombs built in simple style are found in the lower right quadrant. And finally, the last generation of royal burials built in palatial style are located in the left-hand side of the plot with two, the tombs of Yakliel and his father, King Rimmon, uh, located close together in the upper left quadrant. I've also applied a principal component analysis to some entirely different metric data and obtained some uh, some complementary insights. Uh, important uh, takeaway from this is that the tombs uh, identified as royals can be rather clearly separated from those of the higher uh, nobility by the second axis. It was, um, it was necessary to analyze the overall expansion of the cemetery to explain the spatial evolution uh, and genesis of the Royal Cemetery proper. Um, and this was done rather intuitively for lack of, of data. Uh, I've argued that the elite mounds at Ali first started to accumulate uh, alongside a ceremonial road because traces of that appears uh, in the distribution of mounds. So um, at the north, the five largest outer ring wall encircled tombs appear to form a, a distinct linear pattern probably alongside this purported ceremonial road. These now destroyed tombs are much lower uh, than the uh, later Royal Cemetery proper tombs. And they probably constitute Dillman's first knack at, at a dynastic cemetery institution. I have uh, I've argued that the Royal Cemetery proper was first founded by laying out a quarter of stone rings around a smaller and older uh, founding mound. The rings were eventually filled as royal tombs accumulated and over time the, uh, the ceremonial road uh, had been encroached with mounds and a new road appears to have been staked out. 
The quarter of rings which founded the cemetery is conspicuously reminiscent of the official trademark found on over 1,000 uh, stamp seals uh, dating to this precise period. Two uh, stone rings were later added west of the quarter and appears to have further expanded on its spatial symmetry. And um, hereafter, the, the, the cemetery grew and reached its final extent. And at some point, of course, the, the dynasty eventually lost its grip on power. <clears throat> The names Yakliel and Rimon identify these two kings as possibly belonging to an ancient Amorite people. This is the strongest evidence yet for a long-standing hypothesis about the ethnic and linguistic origin of Dilmun. At the same time as kingship emerged in Dilmun, Amorite tribal chiefs conquered every major city in Mesopotamia and established control over ancient Egypt eventually. My inter interpretations have been heavily guided by this Amorite connection. In, and as an example, among Amorites in Syria and Iraq, stone rings are known to have been a sacred stage for intertribal oath swearing and allegiance building. By at least one king, the distinct choreography of the royal cemetery proper was used strategically to stage his tomb favorably in the center of the Western Quarter royal tombs. And I will get back to this guy in a moment. The architectural analysis have uh, enabled us to place the royal tombs in a relevant sequence. And this uh, provides us with the, um, the, the, the desired partial king list. This, this sequence has then been used to model the radiocarbon dated royal tombs by means of Bayesian statistics where you use information about which amount succeeds, which to uh, narrow down the, the span of the dating uncertainty. The, um, the resulting model was uh, made in collaboration with Professor Jesper Olsen from the Department of Physics at Aarhus University. This uh, absolute chronology represents a rather important step that allow our discussions from Dilmun archaeology to be more firmly linked with neighboring historical chronologies and the over-regional development. The model, uh, among others, shows that Yakliel's tomb with a high probability was, was built sometime between 1738 and 1658 BC. Shown here in brown are the earliest stage in the dynastic cemetery at Ali. And th these are the ones I call the proto-royal tombs. Uh, which have been, been destroyed for over 50 years and are hopelessly beyond our reach. In contrast, most of the blue mounds in the Royal Cemetery proper endures as a monument over Dillman's forgotten royal dynasty. The, um, the joint efforts of Bahrain and Moscow also continues at the site. Our analysis show that, that things started to change the Royal Cemetery after the founding portrait had been expanded to the west. In the uh, cramped space in the center of the western portrait, um, as I showed earlier, the, uh, the tomb of, of what from the royal sequence must have been Rimum's father was eventually erected. That this tomb was added as an afterthought is confirmed by the smaller diameter of its outer ring wall. In, uh, in simple consideration of the general consistency in the diameters of the outer ring walls around other royal mounds, this must clearly have represented some kind of compromise. However, to this king, the disadvantage of compromising on the diameter of the outer ring wall was apparently outweighed by the benefits of being able to assume the symbolically powerful position in the absolute center of the quartet of royal ancestors. And whether these were genealogically real or imagined, we cannot tell. This king was clearly one of a kind in more than respects than one. He also had the orientation of his tomb chambers reversed in what by some must have been regarded as a blatant contempt for half a millennium of ritual practice. And some of you may have noticed in the plot um, of the orientation towards uh, sunrise, that one tomb 
have the complete opposite orientation, and this is the one. Building activities at the Royal Cemetery was hereafter referred to the eastern flank, um, starting with the purported tomb of King Rimum. And after that, his son, King Rimum's, uh, uh, King Yachliel's tomb was built. The, um, the two smaller, a larger, uh, the two small and larger tombs northwest of Yachliel's tomb uh, were unfortunately removed in the 1980s. The larger and western most of these has been almost completely level and is currently under a modern village cemetery. More recently, we have um, luckily obtained information that confirms that this, the northernmost tomb, was built in the same style of distinct palatial architecture as Yachliel and Rimum's tombs. Because uh, one of the local potters luckily had a large depot of, of dressed stones from this tomb that had been given to him when it was leveled in the 1980s by the, uh, the backhoe driver. As a result, this tomb can now tentatively be regarded as the tomb of the son of Yagliel. He was um, probably one of the last kings of the Ali dynasty. In the future, we hope to make a small excavation at that site and add C14 datings of this monument to the royal sequence. Last but not least, we are currently excavating the royal tomb called Mount Q. As some of you also may have noticed earlier in the map of Dromos and Shaft distributions, this monument was marked as, as having both a red and a green uh, column. And the reason is that our excavations have shown that after the, what must have been the initial royal burial, the tomb was rebuilt and reused for another royal burial. So it was originally built with a dromos and used for a royal burial in the founding portrait of the royal tombs. So one of the first four. Later, it was broken into, emptied out, rebuilt with a huge access shaft, and then a new royal burial must have taken place. Here you can see the uh, ongoing excavation at uh, Mount Q. <clears throat> As I'm, I'm sure most people are aware, this type of excavation is a huge and time consuming undertaking. All the excavated soil and sand must be taken out manually using buckets. These pictures from the shaft gives an impression of the, the type of work. The, uh, the sandbags you can see are resting on an original plastic ledge that was at level with the door to the upper chamber. During the burial rituals, it probably held a deck of wooden planks or palm beams. And uh, on the right hand photo, the, the people there are standing where the upper chamber used to be located. For unfortunately, it has been violently destroyed and most of its stone masonry now fill up the lower chamber. One of the more exciting observations we have made of this mound is that it appears that all the mounds after uh, destruction were refilled with sand and sort of went through some kind of renovation, but in which period we currently can't decide. In one of the corners uh, where you see me standing on the ladder, the shaft was preserved to its full height. And this documents that it, that the, it was originally 10 meters deep. Here, the, uh, the bronze edge led, ledge has been cleared of the protective sandbags. And the photo shows the fully excavated shaft and gives you an impression of both its scale and proportions. You can, you can note the uh, the, the guy Sala standing at the, at the base. The stone blocking door to the lower chamber remains intact, but uh, regrettably the stone roof has been removed and the chamber has clearly been looted. The rear end wall of the shaft revealed that it had originally been built as a dromos and that it was only converted into a shaft 
at a later point in time. The Dromos fill from the original burial had not been completely cleared and the, uh, the back wall of the shaft had been built resting on about 1.5 meters of, of fill. In the center photo, you can see this curiously high position of the foundation stones of the rear end wall of the shaft. The level of the, uh, the shaft fill after the second burial is clearly shown uh, by the, uh, the areas that were left unplastered on the walls, because at that time they were already, uh, it was already partially filled in with, with new soil. During excavation of the shaft, it became clear that it had uh, been entered before, and it was um, also clear that the upper three meters of the stone blocking door had been opened at some point in time, and we found a layer of stone blocking door stones that uh, was resting on the corresponding level of the shaft fill in front of the door. Later, the, the door had been sealed again, obviously. Uh, but in that process, the uh, original burial was apparently looted or gently cleaned. This, uh, this event of, of, of entering is evinced by a thick layer of, of broken storage vessels that had been discarded in front of the newly opened blocking door. Uh, these vessels um, and any possible remains of foodstuff that were inside them were probably removed from the chamber in the preparation of a second royal burial. And probably this, this second uh, royal burial for this king had died untimely and uh, well before he had had time to construct a tomb of his own. But uh, importantly, during the period of, of, uh, of the more palatial style tombs, uh, why he was in need of a shaft. Um, and so the, consequently, uh, a chef was subsequently constructed and the, uh, the discarded pottery, as you see here, were trampled and uh, later covered in a thick layer of plaster that the, the workers spilled when they, when they coated this, uh, the, the upper eight meters of the shaft. <clears throat> in the lower chamber door, uh, the wet plaster uh, of these builders also flew over the, the partially opened blocking door and this left a distinct uh, hardened layer uh, in the middle of the blocking door. And after the, 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 the shaft conversion project had finished and the, the second burial uh, completed, the door was probably sealed at that point. After the second burial, uh, the, the shaft probably, and that was probably why it was important to build it, functioned as a sacred space where the cult of the royal ancestors, ancestors could be performed in private. And after the duration of, of some unknown period of time, the shaft was eventually filled with sand and soil and, uh, and finally sealed. Um, but yeah, be that as it may, the, uh, the entombed kings once controlled the, uh, the lucrative trade between East and West. And uh, through some combination of, of ideology and wealth, they they successfully managed to institutionalize their dynasty and secure the hereditary uh, transmission of power for many generations. It is, um, it's my hope that with the insights presented in this lecture, our understanding of the Royal Cemetery and, uh, and kingship in Dillman has been propelled forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Stefan, uh, for that uh, amazing presentation. Um, before we move on to question time, uh, we've been asked in our AAA lectures for AWA to ensure that there's a, a short uh, translation that's done by uh, an Arabic speaker. And, and I'm delighted that uh, Khaled Douglas is with us this evening and is able to provide that, that short summary in Arabic of Stefan's presentation. Khaled, if you can uh, unmute now um, then, uh, and you're prepared to start your summary, then please, when you're ready, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so I have to speak in Arabic now. <laughs> في ملخص لموضوع المحاضرة اليوم هي تتحدث تتحدث يعني عن 
الهلال الملكيه في عاليه البحرين تحدث عن المشروع اللي تم التنقيب فيه في 2010 ويتحدث عن يعني قدم انه الكتاب يمكن للاخص نتائج التنقيبات اللي عملها في كتابه اللي نشر سنه 2010 ويمكن تحميل كتابه من خلال بوابته الالكترونيه في اكاديميه. ويتحدث عن انه الحقل المدافع تم اضافته على قائمه اليونسكو ب 2019. تحدث كذلك عن بدء اعمال التنقيب لاكاديميه الخمسينات من القرن الماضي في منطقه الخليج بالذات في منطقه البحرين. وصف المنطقه واهميه البحرين بالذات خلال فترة الألف الثالث والألف الثالث قبل الميلاد بأنها تقع في منطقة متوسطة بين حضارة الوادي السند وحضارة بلاد الرافدين وهذا المكان الجغرافي سمحت للبحرين أن تلعب دور كبير وحيوي وتزدهر فيها صحافي أو حضارة متطورة خلال فترة العصر البرونزي كل ساهمت في يعني احد المكونات اللي كانت تابعه للتجاره في الناس. في خلال فتره الالف الثانيه تحدث انه في منطقه وجود قلعه البحرين الحاليه كان هناك مدينه اداء حكومه الحكومات الاثريه بوجود مدينه مزدهره متطوره كانت محاطه بالجدار بتاعي كشفت من خلال المصادر الكتابية إنها كانت عبارة عن مملكة كذلك كشفت التنقيبات الأثرية فيها إنها كانت تضم مباني كبيرة وضخمة جدا بعد ذلك ما ننتقل المتحدث أو الحديث عن المدافن وتحدث عن وضع المدافن والمكان اللي وجد فيه والحالة لهذه المدافن إنه جزء من هذه المدافن تعرض الى التخريب والتدمير في مراحل مختلفه من الزمن في الفترات القديمه والفترات الحديثه في نشوء مملكه البحرين الحديثه. تحدث على انه يعني كملخص على وجود عمليه المدافن الملكيه بانها تعود الى مؤسسه كانت قائمه في البحرين او في مملكه للاسره الملكيه الواحده هذه المؤسسه كانت تقوم يعني بالاعداد والتحضير لدفن الملك بعد وفاته، طبعا هذا يعني يتطلب العمل في وقت سابق بكثير للتحضير لبناء هذه المدافن حتى قبل وفاه الملك، وهذه المؤسسه اللي كانت موجوده فيها كانت تعكس قوة الأسرة الملكية الملكية داخل المجتمع الوطني. المدافن الملكية كانت تكون على خلاف ضخمي بالمقارنة مع المدافن الأخرى اللي كان الوضع فيها. وجد إنه نتيجة بعد دراسة تلك المدافن إنه كان يتم عزلها في جزء خاص يعني ولم تكن مدمجة مع المدافن العادية حيث وجدت في الجهة الشمالية الشرقية من المقبرة الضخمة في منطقة عالية. يتحدث انه هناك امكانيه توفر ان ان توفر المدافن الملكيه تسلسل زمني دقيق لسلالات الحاكم في جميع خاصه اذا ما تم تاريخ تلك المدافن بواسطه تاريخ المشاعر الكربون والمطار الوطين ويتحدث عن انه المحاضر عن اعداد خمس معلومات كبيره يضم معلومات كبيره جدا حول مدافن البحرين وتوثيقها بحيث انه تسمح لاحقا بعمل اعاده تطور لتلك المدافن. من خلال مخططات الاشكال المدافن يتحدث انه كانت شكلها على شكل اسطوانه متدرجه على شكل درج وذلك في المراحل الاولى وكيف حصل بعض التغيرات على المدافن خاصه في منطقه المدخل. يتحدث كذلك على انه اتجاه وضع الميت كان بالغالب اتجاه الغرب وكانت تبنى المدافن الملكيه في اوقات مذكره طبعا قبل وفاه الملك واتجاه المدافن المقبره الملكيه كانت تتغير مع تغير حاكم الشمس خاصه خلال التباين اللي بيحصل بين موسمي الصيف والشتاء. تحدث عن اهم اهداف المشروع من خلال جمع اكبر عدد ممكن من عينات السي وهذه اللي راح تساعد على عمل بناء يعني 
تسلسل في الزمن وزيد للتغيرات الاجتماعيه اللي حصلت على تلك المبادئ. استمر تقليد تلك المبادئ لفتره طويله ومن خلال دراسه هذه المراحل المختلفه اظهر وجود تغيرات اجتماعيه كبيره لدى المجتمع بينما خلال تلك الفتره. خلال الفترة من 2052 إلى 2050 قبل الميلاد تحدث عن أن وجود تنظيم قبلي داخل المجتمع في البلدان وبدأ يتحدث عن أن هذه المدارس بدأت تأخذ شكل مختلف تشبه شكل رحم المرأة خلال تلك الفترة وأظهرت اختلافات في التسلسل الطبقي للمجتمع وما يسمى وأظهر عليه ما يسمى مدارس الزعماء هذه المداخل الجديدة من 2050 تقريبا يعني الجيل هذا هو الجديد من المداخل بدا يظهر بشكل منتظم له اشكال منتظمة ومناظر منتظمة اصبحت تجربة الدرس ذات شكل مستقيم او على شكل حرف اتش وتظهر هذه المداخل تظهر هذه المداخل ان الجماعات التي دخلت فيها كانت لها قوة كبيرة ومدنة المداخل الاخرى طبعا تعود للملوك وبدا يضاف يعني بدا يضاف اليها حجرات دخل اضافية تكون اما بالطاقه السلفي او بالطاقه العلوي وهذه الغرف الاضافيه كانت مزوده بمصدر من الخيط وهي تشير الى ظهور تقاليد جديده في النظام الداخلي. المدافع المدنيه الملكيه كانت مزوده ببوابه ضخمه جدا من الحجاره ولها بوابه خشبيه من الداخل اللي ولكن يعني لانها كانت تغلق فقط من الداخل وهذا يعني ان هذا يعني ان لا اشخاص او شخص على الاقل كان يبقى داخل الغرفه المدينه بعد اغلاق المكان، وهذا طبعا كان احد تقاليد الدفن، وقد ناقش الباحث هذا الموضوع بشكل اكثر تفصيلا في كتابه. بعدين تحدث عن وجود نقوش كتابيه، من خلال تلك النقوش الكتابيه تم الاستدلال على وجود ملكين على الاقل، هذا يؤكد على وجود الملكيه في ديرمون، وذكر اسماء هؤلاء الملكين من ياجي ياجي ايب وإيمو ولكل واحد من هذه الأجيال الملكة مثل تلقاطية يؤرق يجاني إلى 1730 قبل الميلاد ويعتقد أنه يوم إلى 1750 قبل الميلاد تحدث عن تصريف المداخل الملكية زمنيا فبدأ أركبها زمنيا وتحدث عن المداخل المتكرة مداخل بسيطة بينما المداخل الملكية تطورة كانت يعني بل الفترة الأولى عرض حيثية تلك المداخل داخل منطقة مقاطع عالي كذلك يربط الباحث أثناء الملكين بالعمليين وهذا يدل على تضافق المنطقة العربية ويحاول الباحث ويناقش العلاقة بين المقابل الملكية هادفا للتعرف على العلاقة بين الملوك المسلمين في تلك المداخل وكذلك التعرف على الفترة التي تم فيها الدفن من خلال اتجاه المدخل والشكل المعماري للمدخل ويعتقد الباحث ان الملك الموت ربما كان اخر ملوك عالي. في نهايه المحاضره تحدث عن التنقيب في مونجو انه التنقيب ما زال يعني جايا في ذلك السن وعرض عدد من الصور لاعمال التنقيب في السن وتحدث عن صعوبه التنقيب التخريب الذي تعرض له المدخل والذي تسبب في حدوث تشويش لتسلسل الطبقي. كذلك عرض ان المدخل السفلي للمدخل والمغلق بطبقه من الحجاره وكيف ان سقف المدخل الحجري تم ازالته في الماضي في مرحله الماء في الماضي حيث صرف المدخل ومحتوياته. كذلك تحدث عن العثور على عدد من ضحايا الاوامر البخاريه التي كانت تحوي على اطعمه والتي كانت موضوعه في مرتقات الجنائزيه في المدخل الملكي وعرض عددا من الشرائح يوضح فيها المراحل المختلفه التي استخدم فيها المدخل. حيث اظهر ان المدخل كان له في احد المراحل حجره ربما كانت تدارك فيها بعض الدخول عند زياره المدخل من قبل اقارب الملك المدخل فيها وما زال التنقيب جاري في هذا السن حتى هذه اللحظه. اوكي ثانك يو.